Hi everyone, it is my real joy and honor today to be interviewing Jennifer Gale, um, who is also an astrologer, she's an author, a musician, a certified acutonics um, sound healer, and her work is, is wonderful. It's dedicated to illuminating the connection between heaven, earth and humanity and the healing power of vibration. So we're going to have a wonderful discussion today because the understanding of energy and vibration is absolutely where we're headed. And she's written two books. One is The Science of Planetary Signatures in Medicine, Restoring the Cosmic Foundations of Healing. And she co-authored this and it outlines the connection between astrology and ancient medicine, which is fascinating. And again, reveals how vibration is the root cause of all signatures found in nature, including, of course, our own natal astrology chart. But the one we're going to be really focused on today is um, her other book, which is The Return of Planet Sedna. Um, astrology, healing, and the awakening of cosmic kundalini, which is, of course, is what I was talking to Magenta Pixie about yesterday. And it really provides a comprehensive analysis of Sedna's astrology, mythology, and astronomical influence on our culture, empowering us to co create our own personal mythos. And co creation is big time what I'm endlessly talking about. Um, yes. So, welcome, Jennifer. It's wonderful to to have you here and and um just as a sort of very simple introduction to this most of you listening out there will scarcely have heard of Sedna because we haven't really or Jennifer's certainly been studying her but not not something that most astrologers have been talking about a lot up to now um because she is um very much a deep space planet she has the longest orbit of any planet that we're aware of i think it's 11,400 years um but the reason she is becoming much, much more relevant right now is um, I understand that within the next 50 years, she's going to be at her closest point to the Earth. And in a few months time, she is about to change sign. And that is going to be very significant, not only in the change of sign, but in the aspect she makes to other planets such as Pluto and, and Saturn. And so this is what we're going to be talking about. And um, it's really wonderful to be talking with Jennifer, who's clearly one of the tiny handful of experts out there on Sedna. Um, but there's a lot, a lot to get into. We're going to dive deep in every sense, I, I, I think, Jennifer. So sh shall I begin just with outlining a very simple version of the uh, of the myth? And then you can. Sure, well, well that. first, let me say thank you to you, Pam. It's a pleasure to be here and having this discussion with you. And I really appreciate the opportunity to, to let people know about Sedna and what it has, what she, the myth, the astrology and astronomy really have to teach us and how we are being presented with a choice of these extremes and how we can blend them and be in harmony so that we are offering that up to the collective. Yeah, beautiful. Anyway, thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. No, it's going to be, I'm really fascinated because I've still got L plates on with Sedna. So I'm <laughs> going to find this a fascinating discussion myself. But I know there's some variations on the myth, um, Jennifer, but as I understand it, the core myth is that um, that that Sedna um, needed to be married off, as it were. And the tradition was that she should marry um, according to her father's choice and that the, um, the the husband would always take care of the family, not only uh, take care of his wife, but take care of the family. And so Sedna was was married and this particular gentleman promised, you know, the earth and the heaven, as it were, and to take care of her and the family. And that did not happen. And um, as I understand it, therefore, her father came to uh, get her back, essentially, and take her back in a canoe. But a big storm blew up. And um, in order to save his own skin, his own life, he threw his daughter Sedna overboard. And as she tried to cling on to the canoe and climb back in, he chopped her fingers off. And so she sank to the bottom and her fingers actually turned into beautiful sea creatures. But he did not come that well out of um, this myth. So, you know, just looking at it, the, the, the external uh, male, as it were, the patriarchy of both the husband and the father um, really betrayed Sedna. She thought they were one thing and they turned out to be another. So um, she had a sense that they both had her best interests at heart. And yet there's a strong theme of betrayal coming in, which in a way 
echoes Pluto moving through those last few degrees of Capricorn, which was the sign of the patriarchy. Absolutely. So over yes. to you, Jennifer. Okay. Um, there's a lot <laughs> in every variation of this myth. So I'm going to try to really emphasize the core of what I feel is the moral, if you will, of this myth. Um, first of all, I want to say that Sedna, Sedna's return to our solar system or to our collective awareness is stretching our minds well beyond what we have previously known. And there are many, many firsts that Sedna represents. First of all, first planet to be named outside Greco-Roman tradition. So even though she followed the tradition of her family of origin and honored her father's wishes by consenting to marry this suitor who appeared to be one way and after marriage and the agreement was ratified, found out that her life was completely different, completely far from the creature comfort comforts of her family of origin. However, in my book, and I, I do want to emphasize that, yes, it is a betrayal of the patriarchal way of life that we must opt in, that everything that has been before must be the way it continues. This is not what Sedna is here to teach us. But I do want to emphasize that it is a way of life, it is a perception that it's not men against women or the gender divide. Men have gone through their own wounding and conditioning as well. And so Sedna's message really is about the sacred union, the sacred harmony and blending of these two extreme polarities. But she is inviting us to explore the new, and also to, you know, in my research, it, it's like spirit was showing me that these myth stories could actually be describing astronomical events. And what Sedna, I feel, is teaching us, because the original, this is important, the original meaning of mythos meant legends of the ancient people. And it was later redefined by the church to mean stories veering far from any truthfulness. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's a big wow, right? So, so I feel that Sedna's return is, and, and as she becomes more and more a part of our collective awareness consciously, and this is happening with Uranus in its, you know, transit of Taurus in let's, I think I'm right, that it's April of this year, Uranus will be conjunct Sedna at 17 Taurus in Sedna's discovery chart. And then next year, Jupiter will come along and magnify that. Oh. Yeah. So, and in Sedna's discovery chart, Sedna herself is conjunct the North Node, which represents uncharted territory. We on Earth in our lifetime, completely foreign to us, is this idea of actually stabilizing peace and prosperity for all life and all beings on this planet. That is foreign territory because we, you know, this South Node in Scorpio, the trauma, excuse me, the trauma of the South Node in Scorpio conjunct the sun. That's what we are used to. But this journey through the South Node, Scorpio, North Node, and Taurus is really about, in my view, reversing a love of power to the power of love. And when we look at Sedna's discovery chart, both the rulers of the South Node and the North Node are conjoined in Sagittarius in the fifth house and she has Leo rising. So she dawns upon the world as the innocent child, as the, the one who follows her heart. And this is also the lens through which she views life. And I believe this is an invitation with those two rulers in the fifth house, the Leonin 
perspective, the strong creative will, Sagittarius, what there's so much, I know I'm going off on an astrology tangent here, but there is a close quincunx between um, Pluto, the co-ruler of the South Node in Sagittarius with Sedna itself. So what, how do we blend Sagittarius and Taurus? It is prosperity, number one, abundance, and Taurus is about self-sufficiency, self-esteem, self-worth. But in its polarity to Scorpio, it's also about you have to have that spiritual foundation. You have to know exactly where your worth comes from. And it is not to be equated with how much material things you acquire. There's got to be an inner hidden core of value. And but Sagittarius is optimism, the adventurer, and I think it's placed well in the fifth house of creative self-will. You know, so I, I just feel like we cannot ignore the importance of joy, the importance of wonder, the Leo rising, that there, the sun will come out tomorrow, despite how bleak things may look in the outer world. We've got to remember the heart within to, and, and we've got to be our own shaman. She called out to her father to rescue her. Her father was ill-equipped to do that. And so we are learning to reparent those places in our emotional psyche that have been abandoned. We're learning to find that maturation within ourselves, reparent ourselves, and to find the sacred union of the masculine feminine polarity. I mean, no matter what your gender orientation is, we all have those polarities. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah, so it's so interesting. And I, I mean, because many of the audience are not um, extremely experienced astrologers, some are novices, some are very experienced. But, you know, what's interesting uh, right now, Jennifer, which is make, making Sedna so relevant, isn't it? That, that Sedna is about to move out of Taurus into Gemini in June. And so it's so interesting that both Pluto is moving out of the, the last few degrees of Capricorn at the same time Sedna's moving out of the last few degrees of Taurus, both Earth signs, and they are both going to be kind of end of Taurus, Capricorn, beginning of, of, of Gemini, Aquarius, back forwards, yeah. back forwards, all of this year and all of next year. They're almost shadowing each other. And they both have strong themes of death, because yeah. Pluto is linked to the myth of Persephone, that she was kidnapped and taken down to Hades, and yeah. the Styx, S-T-Y-X, and it was all dark and scary, and then she's transformed and comes back up to the light. And Sedna's myth is also about death and grief, but also transformation. Her fingers turn into these beautiful yes. waves and turtles and dolphins and sea creatures. So there's a strong sense as they both, because Sedna in particular has such an immensely long orbit of 11,400 years and even Pluto 248 years, that we are we are meant to release attachment to earthly yes. things, to materialism, to ownership, to what I often call a kind of territorial materialism, to step mm -hmm. into a whole new way of being, which is much lighter, um, it's, it, yes. it's much more shared communal experience, both Gemini and Aquarius being air signs and Aquarius particularly linked to community and collaboration. And they're in trine. They're in a very, very positive yes. aspect over the next two years. So I see this as being a huge evolutionary leap for humanity yes. in terms of a real sharing, a heart connection and coming together. Truly. To a very you know, a very different earth and a very different world. How do you feel about that? Without doubt, I agree with every word that you've said. And I will uh, add, I realize this is, for me, this is my brand new perspective on the Scorpio journey. But I will offer it to those for whomever it resonates. Um, Scorpio is the only sign in the zodiac that has three symbols, the scorpion, the phoenix, and the eagle. And I equate Mars with a scorpion and the ego that must control at any cost. Yeah. And it will sting itself before it will let another creature have power over it. That's the ego that must die. 
Then we move to Pluto and the Phoenix, the Phoenix that learns to surrender the ego and out of the ashes of the old, you know, former way of being, it creates a new life. It allows that rebirth to take place. But I have found that even in that phase of maturation, it's a constant death and rebirth, and it is exhausting. So Sedna provides the ability to transcend the endless loop of death and rebirth. You could even call it the karmic wheel, right? And this transcension of these extreme dualities and these extreme highs and lows that is a part of the Scorpio journey allows us to find the immortal soul within us, to ride the current of source energy, the creator, and to, you know, with in every moment, we are aware of the extremes. We are aware of the shadow. We are aware of the potential to make that choice, but we choose to go the other way and to not not like cut off the shadow because then we become polarized in a more like superior way of being. Wholeness yeah. is the healing that allows for both to exist in harmony. Yin gives birth to yang, yang gives birth to yin. They must be in an equal balance and dance of energy. So anyway, I, I feel that Sedna really represents the eagle that allows us to soar again. And do you feel that particularly because it's moving into Gemini, an air sign? Because it, it's also about a whole transformation of, of our minds, isn't it? And our yes. perspective and our worldview. Well, here's what's exciting for me about that. Um, Gemini is the storyteller too, right? It's the writer. It's about communication and teaching. And so I feel that story, the art of storytelling, the art of oral tradition where legends and myths are handed down to, we, we can learn so much from the myths. I know that we're used to, oh, well, you got to verify it. It's got to be, you know, substantiated with facts. But there's a lot to learn from metaphor. Music is metaphor. Even math, as the Pythagoreans understood math and numbers, was metaphor. There's so much that we can learn from storytelling. And I feel that this is part of it. And it's also why I feel it is so important for us in the Inuit culture, from which Sedna is named, language is so very powerful. The Inuit understand that language and our words carry a vibration that has the power to conjure the extreme negative or the extreme positive. And we have to choose every moment how we use our thoughts and how they form our beliefs and then how, how what words we use to talk to ourselves, whether we speak those words or not. It's the language we use that impacts our body and also impacts what we draw to us in our lives. So language, that is said in moving into Gemini. We have got to understand how powerful our words are and that we can teach, you know, uh, through storytelling. Yeah, and, and this is so right. Co-create. Yeah, isn't this so interesting? Because it, I endlessly bang on about this, as you probably hear, um, Jennifer. This, you know, th this mastery of of self thinking, of of how we communicate. That every single moment, twenty four seven, whether we realize it or not, we are creating. We are creating. And this is also very much, you know, again, I see Pluto moving into Aquarius and, as well as Sedna moving into Gemini. We are going to really get the mastery of our vibration of our energy yes. signature in order to create a better world individually and collectively. Absolutely. You, you feel it's also about Sedna will, will create for us a whole new story for humanity because she's yes. been in Gemini for eons, isn't she? Oh, That's yes. Sure. I'm not sure when she leaves Gemini, but I mean, she's been in Taurus since 1966, hasn't she? Uh, I I should know the year, but I don't. So I'm going to trust you on that. Okay. I, yeah, everybody. Yes. Well, no. Yes. Yes, you're right. 66, I think. Because I was born in 62. So she. Uh, 
You can edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> it was a whole yeah. era that we're, you know, we're not talking yes. two years. We're talking about a, a huge expanse of time. So she's going to be in there for what, 60, 70 years, something like that. She's got a highly elliptical yeah. orbit though, hasn't she? Very high. Yes. Um, and that's the other interesting thing about one of the versions of the myths that talked about her marrying a dog and it just clicked in me dog star serious she's the immortal sea woman now i don't consider her goddess only because the, in the inuit culture they don't view they don't believe in gods and goddesses per se but they do absolutely believe in the sanctity the sacredness of all life that minerals, plants, animals, humans, all are imbued with the creator's essence. And so that is another really important part of the whole myth story around Sedna because while some myths, I know I'm getting off the point here, so let me go back to her marrying the dog and the dog star. She is an aquatic being. And I believe that it's Sirius B that is more aquatic. and. So I feel like, especially in her chart, you know, you've got the sun, the solar system, her original solar system, the father, our solar system, and then she married a dog star, Sirius. So this extreme elliptical orbit could perhaps be this pull on her orbit between one star system and another. And that's why I feel that myth stories could potentially be describing the astronomical events um wow so and also when she's coming closer to the earth in the next 50 years or so and you know th that that's a really big deal because the orbit's so long she could well be bringing new information because she goes out far to oh, yeah. the Oort cloud doesn't she so new cosmic and galactic information yes. to, to write this new story Yes. Also, absolutely. what you were just saying there was so interesting about really Inuit uh, philosophy and myths are around, I think it's called pantheism, where everything, everything, crystals, rocks, you know, slugs, snails, mosses, everything has sacred essence. Everything is alive. Yes. Everything has divine intelligence. And everything this, has divine intelligence. You know, yes. we're going back to, aren't we? I, I you know, I was yes. talking with, as you know, with Heather Ensworth the other day, I just feel it so strongly that we're, we're going back to that kind of Lemurian frequency of one yes. that's just expressed, divine intelligence is expressing in all these different forms, be they human, animal, rocks, crystals, you know, dolphins, whales, whatever. It's all an expression of divine intelligence. Absolutely. And there, and, and telepathy. I feel like Sedna moving into Gemini could easily be telepathy. I mean, that's a form of communication with these quote unquote inanimate beings or <laughs> objects. And what is important to, um, in addition to what we've discussed, I feel that what's important for us to really understand is, as there are many variations on this myth, um, Many have recounted or, or consider Sedna to be a, a goddess of vengeance. I don't agree with that. And here's why. My understanding and perception of her whole experience is that her hands were cut off, so she has no way to comb her tendrils. And the life that was created from her loss of her hands comes to console her because when the people are not observing the universal law of holding all life sacred, when they transgress against other life, the, their sins, if you will, or their transgressions accumulate on her body like barnacles. So the marine life comes to console her, hence there is no game to provide food or sustenance to the Inuit people who rely on that to survive, to make their, you know, that's, it's the game life in the sea and on the land that provides food and clothing and sustenance to them in these frigid conditions. But if the marine life is 
at the bottom of the ocean consoling Sedna, there is nothing to fish, no food for them. So they send, this is part of their culture, um, up until the turn of the century, they would do shamanic rituals and confess their transgressions. Then the shaman would confer with Sedna and he would be able to free the marine life so that there would once again be food and sustenance. Moral of this story is that we will have greater prosperity in our world to the degree that we are able to see divinity, divine life imbued in all life on our planet. Yeah. And when uh, we, we are already experiencing this square between Saturn and Sedna, and I view this as the, the tension, the dialogue, motivating us to change, but Saturn representing the patriarchal man-made laws that are put upon us, let's say, or mandated, whatever. And Sedna represents the universal law. I love this. Yeah. I love this. I, I think it's coming up so strongly because it reminds me, I don't know if you've investigated the, the Kuiper Belt objects very much, Jennifer, but, you know, when you're talking, um, Orcus comes to mind. Orcus is the uh, Etruscan god of the underworld who was all about um, punishing those people who violated sacred law. Uh, if they violated sacred law, they were, you know, they were punished. They were taken down to the deep underworld again. We're back to the underworld, yes. the deep sea. And um, there's something about that, and Orcus is being highlighted very soon in early March as well. There's something about that and transgressing sacred law. But I, I do want to clarify because I, I don't believe that Sedna's story is about punishing people. It's a natural, organic result yes, yes, of yes, the yes, people's yes. own transgression. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. We've got to take, we've got to hold ourselves accountable and take responsibility. It's not God punishing us or Sedna or anyone else. Yes, when yes, we yes, do yes. not see the divine in the life around us, then we will experience it. And whatever is the appropriate time, we will we will discover the result of that in our own life. Yeah, that is, this is so interesting. So do you also feel, Jennifer, even though Sedna is about to move into an air sign, because her whole myth is is related to, you know, deep, deep, deep sea, you know, ice, mm. Arctic wastes, as it were, um, yeah. and, and that Saturn is about to move into Pisces for three years, we are going to be understanding much, much more about the seas and the oceans. I was talking to oh yeah about this tomorrow, yesterday. So I think we're going to be diving deep in every sense into our greater <laughs> understanding of, of the oceans, what they represent, their food sources, their medicine, um, their myths, yes. um, their healing ability. Um, there's a whole load of stuff there that we are just on the edge of. Do you feel that? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, speaking of metaphor, just think of the ocean as a reflection of the cosmos and how we have so very much to explore. We know so very little about the ocean and the cosmos. But Sedna's, this connection to water is what is so important for us to grasp because you cannot, the way the water element is, it supports life. It freezes from the top down, not the bottom up. It, you know, it sustains the life within it, number one. Number two, when two water droplets meet, there is no separation. We've got to understand as 80% water in our own bodies, the earth is 80% water. This is the ocean of consciousness in which we all swim. It is what connects us all. So really, her, her return is about reminding us how interconnected all life is. But especially, you know, it's to remind us how powerful we are when we tap into that immortal essence of the soul inside that is a spark of the creator. We feel so powerless with everything that's going on in the world. But we are so much more powerful than we realize because just imagine if everyone on the planet really got it, really went within and practiced the divine presence, 
saw through their master's eyes and were able to see all life as divine. If every soul on the planet did that, our world would be a much different place. Absolutely. And so as if Gemini represents the personal mind, mm. then perhaps Sedna coming to the sign of Gemini, you know, it's going to be a stretch. It, it may really challenge many minds out there, but she's going to be there for a long time. We're going to have time to get used to it. And I feel that this is what is on the table. This is what's on the horizon for us. Do you also feel, particularly because of that trine to Pluto as well, Jennifer, that this may bring yeah. in a lot more galactic contact or galactic oh, yeah. understanding? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, Pluto moving into Aquarius, this is going to be going down the rabbit hole of uh, all things Aquarian. And it does include the eccentric uh, off-world beings. And I, <clears throat> what else was I? Oh, oh, I also was thinking because Pluto is about right use of power and also wherever we see pluto in whatever sign pluto is in that is where we are going to see power rise up let's say and i do believe that humanity is going to become more aware of how powerful they are in the way that i just described every human soul I totally agree, 100%. The power is beginning to shift to the people, not in a term, not in terms of waving placards and shouting. Uh, and right. It's much more to do with an inner sense of your own sovereignty. And that's Absolutely. going to be a massive shift that will change everything, will change people's worldview, their perspective. Um, and, and a sense of, again, a phrase I often use, stepping back into our galactic citizenry. And, yes, and Absolutely. Because this is, yes, thank you. And I see that with a, with a trine between Pluto and Sedna, because Sedna itself, her return, is reminding us that we are not just citizens of planet Earth. We are citizens of the cosmos. And everything that we do here as a human family on this planet reverberates into the cosmos as well. Same thing as with water, the ocean of consciousness. It doesn't stop at planet Earth. It goes well beyond. Yeah, and there's no boundary with water, is there? Right. It's the ocean right. can't be separated. It's, it's actually one huge ocean, isn't it, as I understand yes. it? It just flows into each other. So, yes, and, and there's something very profound in this. And I've been talking about this a little bit, about the, the water we, we take in is essentially a, a living liquid consciousness. A living liquid consciousness and if we send love to it and yes. gratitude it changes the structure of the water that we ingest and absolutely ourselves just that sending of thought sending of emotion to the water before we take it in and that you know also affects the entire water yes. of the earth ultimately totally i'm so glad that you brought that up because i know you're aware or um love the work of Dr. Masaru Emoto and the water crystals. And one of the one of the things that I found so fascinating is that, I mean, along with Masaru, <clears throat> excuse me, along with just Dr. Emoto, Wilson Bentley, who photographed snowflakes made out of water, you know, this to me is the most beautiful metaphor for soul's journey through eternity and the argument, if you will, for astrology and the astrology signature. No two snowflakes are alike. And what Wilson Bentley discovered is that <clears throat> it's, it was the actual journey of the snowflake through what he called cloudland, their exposure to the elements that formed or that signature, that unique configuration of each snowflake. And I feel that the natal signature also reveals soul's journey through eternity and tells the story. But that story can come to life in so many different ways. And before we get off snowflakes, I just want to say Johannes Kepler, who was known for the laws of planetary motion, also wrote a little book about snowflakes. He was fascinated with them. 
Whoa. So, so I, I mean, it's just, to me, it's another example of how the creator speaks to us through metaphor number one, and also how the message can be seen in such a tiny, simple thing like a snowflake, or it can be as sophisticated as astrological, you know, and astronomy language. <laughs> wow. Wow. There's so much in that. And, and you also feel with Sedna coming closer, Jennifer, that we, and and also I think Pluto moving through those final degrees of Capricorn, because it's so much about death and grief. Are we going to be diving deep into some very profound emotion as we go through this? Oh, world? yeah. Oh, yes. In, um, in, without a doubt. In an unprecedented way or to an unprecedented level than we've ever done before. Well, I mean, let's, you got to think about Pluto and Pluto was discovered in 1930 and think about what arose 15 years later, the atrocities that we had to grapple with on the collective with, you know, the Holocaust and the end of World War II. Sedna's extremes are even more extreme. So I do believe that it's going to be the polarization of heaven and hell. I mean, we're going to have that that choice. It depends on our perspective. That is why it is so important for every single individual to understand the power they have and to practice divine presence, to practice that. Because we are definitely going to be rocked to the core when we discover, when disclosure arises from an even deeper deep. <laughs> yeah, and then, even you and I as astrologers, I think, are going to be rocked. What well, did you say? All, I think even you and I as astrologers, gentlemen. Oh, oh, God, all, yes. Yes. All going to be rocked. But Absolutely. But I also have great hope. Just before I hopped onto the call, I was just noticing, because I, I, you know, I'm starting to work more and more with the Kuiper Belt objects and the dwarf planets, and I just noticed that so many of them are are transit well well firstly even before we get to the Kuiper belt objects saturn is on the 8th of march leaving aquarius 29 of aquarius into beginning of pisces yeah. um pluto is moving towards 29 of um capricorn and hovering back and forth as we've said between zero of aquarius 29 of capricorn for the next two years but we've also got manwe um, who with his wife Varda originally created the cosmos, it is said, um, in the myth, and is the highest source of divine intelligence closest to the mind of God. Manwick is currently at zero of Aries. That's oh. the first degree of the zodiac. And therefore Sedna is not only trying to Pluto and square to Saturn, but sextile to Manwick. Oh, and, wow. And when Sedna enters Gemini in June... She is still going to be sextile to Manwe because Manwe by then will be at two degrees of Aries. So this is this is really profound transformation of the new world, of the new earth. And not only yes. that, um, Sedna, if I've got my geometry right, appears to be in a, a finger of fate or a finger of God configuration with um, Homer at zero of Scorpio in June and Ixion at three degrees of Capricorn. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, you know, considering the Kuiper Belt objects, all of them are around about a 300-year orbit, to have so many of them, even if we leave Saturn out of the picture, in, you know, it, this tipping point of ending, beginning, ending, beginning, ending, beginning. Very much. Uh, yes. It's extraordinary. You know, yes. it's... And, and we know, don't we, that our bread and butter planets, if we look at, you know, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, they are all going to be changing sign between 2023 and 2026. And I think yes. about 300 years to when that happened before. But now, wow. because we've discovered them, we can factor in the Kuiper Belt objects as well. And that, you know, I need to think about this a lot more because there's so much in this. And I just discovered it before I hopped onto our Zoom call. But that is profoundly transformative, I think. For our it is. It is undoubtedly. So, finger of God, that's our destiny. So, mention those three again. It's Sedna, and I'm not familiar with the other two. Okay. I've heard you talk about so, them. but So, Manwe is, um, um, Tolkien wrote about Manwe and his wife Varda in his book Cimmerillion. And in the myth, 
he and his wife Varda were said to have created the original cosmos. And, oh. um, and, yeah. and Varda created the stars and the heavens. She placed the sun and moon and stars in the sky. Um, interestingly, Varda is going to be on the galactic center in June when Sedna changes um, oh, wow. his sign. Um, but Manwe is, is said to be the highest archangel, closest to the mind of God, mind of God, highest source of divine intelligence. He's beyond the dimensions of time. So he's going to be, he's currently at zero of Aries on okay. the world axis. But Beautiful. he's still, even in June, when Sedna moves into Gemini, he's at two degrees of Aries. So Sedna yeah. will be sextile Manwe. And that talks about, you know, it, it transformative opportunities for a whole new world being created, a whole new earth being created. And Sedna Absolutely. will then in June be in a finger of God, finger of fate at the, at the pointy end of the <laughs> of those two yeah. between Homer at zero of Scorpio and okay. Homer in myth. She's related to the um, Hawaiian goddess of fertility, who in myth was able to birth babies from all over her body, just not the, not even the regular places. I mean, she was. Wow huge regenerative principle and um she had this magic stick called the makalai and even <laughs> when the land was laid waste through poor agricultural practices and um, and you know there was scarcity of food she could magic up wild food from the land and the seas oh wow stick. so she's a hugely regenerative yes and i also think it just dawned on me the, uh, a couple of months ago because I'm having regenerative medicine myself on my knee. And that was exactly the day that Homer moved into Scorpio. And it's regenerative oh, wow. medicine, Scorpio. <laughs> but also... But Scorpio is in and of itself regenerative. And then you've got Homea there. That's incredible. And, and she, then to be in a quincunx with Sedna is... Incredible. I mean, that's all about our own ability to create as... And also... Okay. Abracadabra... <laughs> That magic, the magic stick, abracadabra actually means I create what I speak. Yep. 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 One. So you've got Sedna and Gemini communication. Be aware, be conscious of the words you use. And then in that relationship with Homea. And uh, so, yeah, I just wanted to say. She was also a shaman. She had an instinctive connection to the earth she understood it all almost in a kind of lemurian way you know there was just a oneness she was completely wow aware. and then ixion um at three degrees of capricorn so we'd still just about include that in the in okay the um ixion at one level is the lawless brother of pluto who had oh, no really? moral compass, who oh, murdered my. his father-in-law and was kind of expelled by the gods. And then Zeus gave him a second chance, but he blotted his copybook by trying to rape Zeus's wife. So at that point, he was sort of spun off into eternity on a burning wheel for having just oh, my a, a total lack of morality. But on the higher level, this is about going your own way and following your bliss and finding joy in simplicity, joy in the simple connection to nature. Yes. And going a completely unique way outside the rules of society to create Love. this, you know, this joyful, blissful existence of simplicity. And that to me, wow, wow, wow. If we're thinking about New Earth, I mean definitely what a picture. What a picture. I wish I'd had more time to think about it, but I, I only spotted this about 10 minutes before we hopped on. So, you know, there's so much in that. There, there is, is so, so much in there and I love it. It's uh, that brings a great deal of hope, uh, just as you said. I mean, because I do feel that the finger of God is our collective destiny. And with Sedna being the focal point of this Yod, then you know, there's a lot of hope for humanity if we can just really take this to heart and and live from that innocent, wondrous place of the child within, follow our heart and understand how sacred all life around us is, understand what power we have in our words, our thoughts, our deeds, and that it reverberates instantaneously, simultaneously. That's the other thing about Sedna and the nature of water. Time, oh, and that's, 
That's the other thing about Saturn in Sedna because Saturn is chronos, chronology, linear time. That's going bye-bye, you know. Sedna is the planet with greater power here because it's the planet furthest from Earth. Uh, but I, Sedna's perspective on time is non-linear. And so again, this non-linear and non-rational, it does not mean irrational to you scientists out there. It's not irrational, it is non-rational time. And therefore, as soon as we think something, immediately it takes effect. It's a little scary, but it reminds us how important it is to manage our triggers, to manage our emotions, to hold ourselves accountable, even if we've been, when we have been betrayed, deceived, uh, traumatized, whatever, we cannot continue to be disempowered by the individual who, who was in that dance of energy with us. We have got to reparent ourselves to go within and allow the divine parent mother father god to help us overcome these triggers so that we're not polluting the ocean of consciousness further by putting blame outside of wow. ourselves because you know if it is the case that our individual consciousness produces our individual reality therefore by logic yes. it has to be the case that our collective consciousness produces the reality and and, and so yes. therefore we are kind of as you say, not taking our own responsibility for what has been produced in society. And, right. and, and, and therefore, we have to recognize that collectively we have produced some uh, challenging stuff, certainly in the last three years, but that at the same time has acted as a massive catalyst yes. on our own awakening. It has had totally. purpose, although it's been a horror in many, many ways for many, Absolutely. many people. It's been a huge catalyst because without that, we would have trolled along, same old, you know, stayed in the same old jobs, come home, had a microwave meal, watch Netflix, rinse and repeat the next day. You know, there's yep. no fertilizer or fuel right. to right. go deep and, 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 and take that road less travel to, to, to awaken to a different level of reality. So if it yep. is the case that as soon as we think it, the Sedna and Gemini were going to be there. That says amazing things. We think of Gemini about transport. It's the sign ruled by Mercury. Oh, yeah. You know, are we are we going to be on Sirius in in seconds? <laughs> are we going to be on the Pleiades in in, in seconds? You know, October. Well, I, I think you know, for those who saw the movie Contact, I think there's a lot to be said about that. I mean, without physically traveling there, we can be there. We can have that experience wow and also and i was talking again yesterday about this but that really reinforces the work of professor robert temple who talks about these um essentially plasma highways which are filaments of light that go for billions of miles and our thoughts and our emotions produce those you know add to those yes. in every moment and if by thinking it we can experience it without the physicality of being there that really reinforces his work and what what he was saying, which becomes immensely exciting. And, yeah, and, and you know, I really, really agree with you about the dissolution of time because if we think of of, of Kronos, Saturn moving into Pisces, Pisces will dissolve Saturn, yeah. dissolve the time. And because Sedna mm -hmm. has such a massively long orbit, I mean, time doesn't exist way out on the edge of the Oort cloud in right. the way we see clock time. I think the further exactly. out we get in deep space planets, the more time just disappears because their orbits are so long. It has no right. relevance. Absolutely, I, I love that. Um, yeah, the way that we will be experiencing time is more fluid in with Saturn in Pisces, far more fluid. And uh, yeah, the other, the other thing I was just gonna mention about Sedna is because Sedna was named outside Greco-Roman tradition, she brings ancient history back to North America. And it is, you know, the Inuit culture is still, 
acknowledge, let's just put it this way, they still acknowledge Sedna wow. in present day culture. So right. it brings ancient history and future possibilities squarely back into our present consciousness. Again, just emphasizing the fact that all time exists right here, right now. That's how I see that. And is it also, Jennifer, that because the Inuit peoples are one of the few truly um, kind of coherent, very long-standing traditional communities that look after each other, care for each other, you know, like an extended family. Mm -hmm. Is there oh. also that whole idea being brought back, which reinforces the Pluto in Aquarius of moving back into community, collaboration, yes. sharing, heart-to-heart -heart connection, you know, the extended family of families of frequency that I think, I think that's where we're headed. Is, is that part absolutely. of the move, moving so close to earth? I absolutely agree with that. And, and I think, um, well, yeah, I can't really, I really can't add to that. <laughs> It, it's um, interesting, isn't it, with Saturn in Pisces, because Saturn is about division and separation and walls and boundaries, and I've got right. a fence at the front, and this is my territory. And and so with Pisces dissolving that, you know, yeah. all of this sense of ownership is, you know, and, and Heather Innsworth. Thank you. Yes, yes. Say, the word for ownership does not exist in those. We're moving from ownership and possession to stewardship. That's the other thing about the Sedna uh, story <laughs> said yeah. in a myth and the Inuit culture it is about stewardship sacred stewardship rather than power over or possessing another creature being whatever we, yeah we have to understand that we are stewards of this planet <clears throat> excuse me stewards of earth we are stewards of everything on earth and, and even you know even our wealth um I've been looking, well, think about South Node Scorpio, North Node in Taurus. This is going to finish up the month after Sedna moves into Gemini. Absolutely. So, but we've got to get this balance between acquiring and eliminating. Um, however, you know, Scorpio and South Node Well, I, I, I'm, I don't want to, I don't want to confuse the issue. I, I'll just keep it to my simple. We're graduating from a love of power to the power of love, but we're also understanding where prosperity really comes from, and yeah. it goes back to the stewardship that we were talking about, understanding um, that all life is sacred, and to get this to understand that we must have a spiritual foundation for our values in order to truly build what Taurus wants to build in that unfamiliar territory of peace and prosperity long lasting peace and prosperity yeah, and so, it comes from love because it's ruled by Venus and, you know, isn't it interesting that, that Sedna's moving out of the Earth sign of Taurus, Pluto's moving out of the Earth sign of Capricorn. We've got this um, Jupiter-Saturn repeating conjunction no longer in Earth signs, which is done for about 200 years, but has already, as of December 2020, moved into air for another, I think, 140 years. So that's setting the zeitgeist. You know, it's air, yes. air, air, you mm -hmm. know, big time. We're, we're moving back into that. And, you know, it's so interesting that in more modern societies, things that the traditional people would would do unthinkingly for their fellow um, fellow community members, you know, um, childcare, pet care, whatever, we've monetized all of those. Yes, 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 yes. I know. Whereas in those cultures, that it just doesn't exist. That sense right. of, of of ownership division does not exist. So I think. We yeah. will increasingly start to gather together in tribes of frequency. We will mm -hmm. come together, whether it's online or ideally physically, as yes. extended families of frequency. And those groups are already, they're all over the world in a very 
early embryonic um, fashion at the moment. Absolutely. Yep. They are going to grow into newer. And they, and they will rise to the surface, I think, when Sedna enters Gemini. And the other really uplifting thing about that, because, uh, you know, the earth and water signs are yin, feminine. So energy moves down. And that it served its purpose. You know, we needed to go within to achieve this balance because we've been in a patriarchal world. But having to digest and process these very deep subjects and the things that will be disclosed with Sedna, it's going to be nice to have more fire and air, more yang to raise the energy up so that we're not so bogged down with the heaviness of it all. But, all, you know, again, to understand the power that we do have with our consciousness, our personal consciousness and um, the responsibility that we have in that respect. So do you see it as a revolution in consciousness, Jennifer, that we're moving into? Oh, yeah. Love that. Yes. Could, you said it all right there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so do I. And, you know, in Aquarius, Sedna and Gemini, revolution of consciousness. Absolutely. And I, I see it as a massively creative period, a blossoming of humanity and in ways that we can barely articulate or, or, or imagine, because a lot of it is going to be science and technology. And we have to be very careful how we, you know, is this, is this beneficial for mankind or not? And very careful how we make our micro decisions through the day. But potentially this is going to take us to a level that humanity has never experienced before because we've never ascended in physicality before. This is that's this, right. There's no rehearsal for this. No, no. We are. And again, that's Sedna. Unprecedented territory. Brand new. I mean, we have never encountered. We astronomers have discovered many, many planets, but Sedna is the furthest away. And so and, and Sedna has. She's the, the first in many different respects. Um, I've listed them all and I don't want to recount them here because I talk about them in my book, but astronomer, I will say this, astronomers broke IAU protocol to name her. They were so convinced this planet, this object that they discovered had to be named Sedna. They broke protocol with the International Astronomical Union. And fortunately that name was upheld, but so many firsts with this planet and so yes unprecedented unprecedented territory and this is a good thing it's exciting yeah and uh, you know it's very interesting that um with her myth particularly when she's thrown overboard and then fingers chopped up there's a sense of, of surprise for sure shock death but ultimately a beautiful transformation into a whole new yeah. a whole new form and i think that's where we're actually going literally with our physicality I think we're literally we're transforming from density and in, into light. I had a very vivid um, yes. part of a dream the other night, and I think we're we're literally becoming light bodies as we move forward yes. into all this air. We're becoming light Absolutely. bodies. We're just shedding that that weightiness of hundreds of years of heavy industry, fossil fuels. Um, you know, yeah. our status <clears throat> by our wealth and our our. our you know our money and it's going to be utterly different we're going to be flowing in the oneness of consciousness flowing beautiful. in the oneness of consciousness beautifully said i couldn't agree more it's exciting is there anything <laughs> else <laughs> you'd, like to, you'd like to share jennifer or add about sedna on top of all that you've said I don't know that there's anything else I can add. I mean, uh, I think the fluidity that you just described, understanding we're stewards, understanding that our experiences and the things that come to us, they flow through us. We've got to just like, oh, I remember what Heather said in your conversation and I loved it, that we can't grasp the boat of our previous life. We've got to learn to let go and let the creator carry us, we, we've got to trust. I mean, that's the other thing about embracing the inner child. 
The Leo rising, the fifth house placement of the south and north node rulers um, in the fifth house of Sedna's discovery chart. The wonder of a child, being able to trust, being able to stay in the moment. That's the other thing that Pisces and Leo have in common. Highly creative. Saturn moving into Pisces. We're going to have to, you know, Pisces is about being fluid being in the moment and trusting whatever arises as part of our creative expression and and to, so to relinquish with the grasping that's what i would say yeah that was that's so powerful isn't it in the myth and and heather reiterated it the other day and and also also jennifer i think my very strong sense and i said this to somebody the other day but my very strong sense is it is not going to take decades and decades and hundreds of years to fix stuff right. my sense is there's such a rapid energy mm -hmm. shift that stuff is going to get fixed in, in in rapid ways that we don't fully comprehend yet okay yes and the fact that pluto in aquarius pluto is revealing things that have been hidden way down you know and I, I just want to say, I believe that science and technology has been, there's a, there's a lot of advanced science and technology that will benefit us yeah, that has been held back. Yep. And so when that gets disclosed and that gets revealed, we're going to be moving light years ahead like that. I really agree. Healing technologies, which are starting to come to the fore already, because Pluto mm -hmm. moves into Paris 23rd of March, and, you know, we're in, we're in that energy already. But, yes, you know, free energy, there are many, many technologies which are going to be absolutely transformative for humanity. Yeah. They're already there. They're already here. They exactly. Just and so I think we have a great deal to look forward to. We just have to stay in love. We have to stay in joy. We have to stay in gratitude. We have to beam that out to the world and transform. Beam that out and, and stay in trust. Understand that, like you said, that collective shadow, it's serving a purpose. It ain't fun. It ain't pretty. It never is. But we cannot repress it anymore. We cannot ignore it. it we've got to be our own shamans, do our own rescuing dive down deep into our own personal waters of consciousness and you know and and love those abandoned places whatever they are for us as individuals and uh and when we do that we're going to see just how powerful we are as a collective human family i i profoundly I profoundly agree with that, Jennifer. And that's a lovely, lovely note to, to end on. And this has been such an exciting discussion. I knew so little about Sedna and, you know, I just kind of trusted we'd have a bit of a an out there discussion, <laughs> literally. So uh, I so yeah. appreciate the opportunity to have this discussion with you. I really do. No, it's been joyful and so inspiring, actually. And, we, you know, we couldn't get a bigger picture than Sedna. They, yeah, that's for sure it's as big as it gets in our current knowledge so so yes. bless you on all of your research and your books i'll put all of your relevant details below this video so people can thank you um, find out how to come to you and get your books etc and and just thank you so much for your your time jennifer and and thank you your too. mastery and your knowledge so thank you so much uh, and um and thank, thank you, you. Um, thank you everyone who's given time to to listen to this and really hope it's helped you on your journey we are on, on such a a fast track we are ascending at dizzying speed in 2023 so hang on tight but ultimately we've got to release and transform so um that's the message god bless everybody god bless jennifer thanks so much for being here thank you pam